Hi, um, I'm Leela de Kretzer and I'm the Global Breaking News Editor at Reuters. Uh, today's panel is on Industrial Policy 2.0, um, a new era of government intervention uh, has occurred. Um, and many governments are bringing in new policies uh, to spare economic growth. But the question we have is, is it possible to avoid the mistakes of the past, of the past and balance uh, competitiveness with global cooperation? Uh, we've had some uh, preliminary discussions in the back, so I'm pretty excited about what today's panel is going to bring us. Uh, there's some varied views amongst this group. Um, I want to introduce our panellists uh, to the left of me. Uh, we have the Saudi Minister for Indi Industry and Mineral Resources, Bandar al Khoriaf. Uh, the Siemens CEO and President, Roland Bush. Uh, we have the uh, Laura Deandra, sorry, we have two distinguished economists, uh, Laura Deandra Tyson and then uh, Adam Posen. And then we also have the UK Shadow Secretary of Business and Trade, J Jonathan Reynolds. So I want to welcome them all here today. Okay, we're going to start with some practical views from the ground. So I'm going to start with you, Roland. Um, we know Germany's uh, made a, a, some efforts to de-risk from China. What steps is that prompting Siemens to take in response? Well, um, let, let me set the frame. In, uh, I mean, the German's operating model is, of course, technology. And we are industrial, industrialised company uh, country. We are uh, living on export. Um, and uh, living in the midst of a transformation, obviously. The transformation is triggered by, we call it megatrends, um, which is, I mean, climate change or, or taking care about lose, using less resources, it's urbanization, it's aging societies, which is a big topic, labor markets. Um, it's another one which we call glo localization. We used to call it globalization, it's now globalization, which is all about uh, increasing resilience. Actually, we believe that the, the the world's operating model is somehow broken, which was about low labor cost arbitrage. So put everything in manufacture at one place, and this is over-optimized. So this has to be just somehow pulled back. And the last one is digitalization, which is rolled into everything. So what's happening now is that this is the, a huge transformation. And in Germany, the energy price um, is, goes up because we don't have the cheap gas from Russia anymore, and this will stay. So all energy-intensive industries are un under dispute. The other one is um, how can we maintain export in a localized work uh, world. So the next one is about innovation, digitalization. How can we, f as fast as possible, get access to this technology in order to drive innovation and maintain our industry? So the point is that, um, and now I, I make it rather short, I do believe that in Europe slash Germany we are over-regulating. Um, so this is really throttling innovation. I mean, just name the AI Act, the Data Act, Cybersecurity Act. It's derived from a B2C business model, rolled into a B2B business model, and that doesn't just help. So that's one problem. The other problem is, talking about the energy transformation, um, what happens is that we are going from an OPEX-based model, build a cheap power plant and buy, buy fuel later on into a CAPEX-based model. It's all about renewables. This is CAPEX front-loading. So how can governments, governments help in order to front load, including all the infrastructure needs, the grids? So um, rather than thinking about how to set the frame on providing infrastructure and see how we can use that one in terms of subsidies, um, you should not um, subsidize particular technologies. So this is another problem. So don't do that. Let the market decide, but set the frame what you want to achieve. So this is happening. Um, I think we're over-regulating. Um, but uh, at the same time, I do believe there's a substantial strengths of, of the, the, the industrial strengths, small and medium-sized enterprises, which helps us. So it's a, it's a fine balance, but uh, transformation happens and things have to, be, have to, have to change. Well, on that note, uh, Minister, I mean, you must be speaking to business leaders. Um, how are you approaching uh, the policies you want to bring in in Saudi Arabia? Well, thank you for having me. First of all, I have... Uh, solution for most of your problems. So. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. We should talk. Uh, um, I, well, for us in Saudi, I mean, the, the whole essence of our vision 2030 is diversifying the economy, making it more complex. So probably many people think that Saudi Arabia has a lot of protective policies, which is not the case. Today, our average custom duty is less than 4.5%. And therefore, it's an open market today. Whatever we produce in Saudi is actually 
globally competitive. But what we are trying to do is really diversify our uh, offering of uh, uh, the different sector. We are trying to give also uh, uh, Saudi Arabia its share, a fair share of different capabilities that needs to be built. So our policies uh, are actually three dimension, and one is really the overarching policy that's uh, uh, geared towards uh, making the environment of investment an environment that is uh, a clear, transparent, uh, uh, competitive. Um, we don't, uh, as, as, I, as Roland uh, rightly said, we don't try to support uh, certain sectors uh, indefinitely or spoil them. So that's the overarching, and then we have uh, probably the other dimension is looking at how can we accelerate some of the, the things that we want to happen faster, so like uh, energy transition, like automation and um, uh, technology, uh, human capital development, and uh, these are also cross-cutting because one is to solve them, you solve them for all. And the other side, the third, uh, probably angle of, of, of our third dimension is looking at the different sectors that we are trying to build. So automotive, what can we do to help a complete automotive uh, cluster to be built in uh, pharmaceuticals, the same thing and so on. So I think this three dimensional uh, way of looking at policy making is helping us also create the right policies that will address the, uh, the right balance between the interest of the nation, trying to maximize the added value, getting the best out of our natural resources, but most importantly, allowing for investors to come uh, and invest for a long term. The sector, as, as, uh, as Roland also mentioned, it's a, it's a high uh, uh, in, 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 uh, investment sector. It's a capital intensive. Capital. It needs a very long uh, view how to, to look. So it's a long play. And the same thing also with with uh, with mining. The, how can we integrate mining as 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 a resource with with the industrial sector? We want to create the right enablers to ensure that we we do not fall on the trap of uh, others who've done mining before, where the resources are being moved from the the country to be processed elsewhere. So these are the kind of mm. uh, of general policies that. Um, and then I think the, the framework of policy making then need to address the, the challenges that happen as, as you know, uh, uh, what, like what is happening today in, 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 in the Red Sea. Or these are things that we need also to build in, in the policy framework so that governments can react quickly because we cannot predict the future, but we need to be ready. So, Jonathan, uh, you'll notice that nowhere included in that was de-risking um, from China. Uh, but your government, um, according to the polls, uh, your party, sorry, could be in government soon. <laughs> so how much is uh, the new Labor going to intervene um, with uh, policies that could reshape business and trade? Yeah, well, first of all, we will have an explicit industrial strategy, so that is obviously a significant difference to the UK at the moment, and part of that is about the traditional objectives of, of any industrial policy, so growth, productivity, the regional distribution uh, across a country of there. But I, I do think the two earlier contributions highlight one of two areas which is something additional to maybe how this debate has changed compared to sort of the, the relatively recent past. One is about de-risking. I, I mean, I think the events of, of Ukraine and the pandemic, uh, what we now see in, in the Red Sea, that kind of question about the resilience of supply chains alongside their the diversification is, is part of that. That isn't just about, though, I think, supply chains. I mean, it, it's partly about public policy, too. In, in the UK, for instance, we um, were not exposed to significant quantities of Russian gas, but, of course, our electricity price is set by the gas price, and therefore, you know, the impact of that crisis was, was particularly significant. I think the bit that hasn't yet been mentioned, which is perhaps the most advanced in terms of the discussion of public policy in the United States it is about how net zero is achieved and, and, and managed. And I think this is obviously something in the UK we've not really got into to the same degree in the past, but it is, I think, it's just essential as a politician to understand that the, the success or otherwise of decarbonisation is, is partly about public consent and about the need for that to be just and equitable. And I think a recognition, the traditional concepts of policy being based just on what is fastest or cheapest 
you know, in, that, in the main, obviously, has a, a direct relationship to policy around China, that will not carry the degree of public support that is necessary. I, I think that's fundamentally where the United States has got to ahead of a lot of European countries. It, it doesn't mean you are getting back to, you know, an old-fashioned sense of protectionism or about the state picking winners as, as a phrase that's often associated with the 1970s in the UK, but it, it's got to be understood that to deliver the level of public consent for what I think we all want to see, you've got to do that in a way which works for people. There's a tremendous set of opportunities and new technologies in, in you know, CapEx opportunities working people have to have a, a share of that. They have to do that. And I think good public policy around industrial policy today fundamentally has that at its heart. So how much would you limit um, China's influence in Britain? I mean, following in the US footsteps to such a degree, is that going to be part of your policy? Well, I, I think you've got to have heed to the sophistication of the debates. So of course, you have a, a very set of assertive policy measures in the US around China. You also see bilateral trade between the US and China to be at record levels. So it's not necessarily about closing something off, but I think the, the recognition that there are sensitive areas that, that, that need to be protected, and that, you know, for instance, to take the United Kingdom, which is in the main a services-based economy, but with significant manufacturing, if the transition in the United Kingdom was seen to simply be about outsourcing emissions to other countries and reducing them in that way rather than a public-private collaboration in the, in the transition, I think that would severely undermine you. Know, we say in the UK, if decarbonisation was about deindustrialization, I just do not think it would carry the consent of, of working people. So it, it's, it's not about essentially approaching it from the view of limiting the relationship with any one country, but getting a fair and equitable set of policy measures which ensure that those dangers aren't met. Okay, well, we've circled around the big elephant in the room, so now I'm going to go to the American economists. Um, Laura... We're not making it. You know, when it comes to competitiveness versus global cooperation, we've seen massive investments in the US, um, the IRA and also chip uh, reshoring. Um, is it possible for there to be cooperation when you've got such a big player bringing everyone into its tent? So, I... <sighs> I want to start a little bit with the, the goals behind industrial policy and then to say that I think there is room for cooperation and I actually think that U.S. legislation allows for cooperation. So the goals here are really, they're, they're two really quite separate goals. There are national security goals associated with semiconductors. It's semiconductors, it's like, if you think about it, it's like Oil, it's essential. It's essential to the digital economy going forward. If you look at the global structure of the semiconductor industry, you are shocked to find that almost all of the advanced chips in the world are produced in one place, in Taipei. And um, there is only one producer of the manufacturing equipment, and that's in the Netherlands. So, Basically, is that a competitive market structure? Does that make any sense? How did we get here? And we've got to do something about it, okay? Now, that is a global, you could say that's a global issue. We need a competitive, resilient, uh, sustainable, semiconductor global industry, okay? And look, I think what the US is doing here is we're saying, you know, you want to be part of that? come to the United States and build the facilities here. So, so the preference in the policy is where you locate your investment. It's not choosing US winners. It's not saying it's this company, it's that company. It's So basically, I, I really want to say here, it's really to try to create additional competition and supply. The preferential part of it is to say, in order to get these subsidies, in order to get to participate in the microelectronics complex that DOD is developing, you need to be in the US, but you can be foreign, except you cannot be, and this is where the China issue comes in, you cannot be a Chinese company. Okay, that's not because the national security threat in semiconductors is viewed by the United States to be a, uh, a China threat. So let me go to the second area of industrial policy, which is really quite different. And that is to say, we want to build a strong green industry, products and services. We want to accelerate action to net zero. We want to give incentives to the private sector to accelerate investment to get to net zero. Again, those, most of the form of this is taking tax incentives. That's what the US Congress is capable of enacting. We don't have a lot of grants, a lot of funds, a lot of investment support. We just have a lot of tax incentives. 
And again, the tax incentives are available for production in the United States. So it's, you don't have to be a US company. Now, in that sense, what I would say is the US policy is really trying to build more competitive global industries to accelerate the R&D. There's a lot of R&D money in this. And a lot of the R&D money is available to companies. And a lot, of the com a lot of the knowledge coming out of science will be available to companies. So I actually think it can be <coughs> global. And, and the US has backed off correctly, correctly. In some of the initial IRA stuff, it really was not only did you have to produce in the United States, but you had to be a domestic content by a domestic supplier. The US has gotten rid of most of that stuff at the response to Europe, which correctly said, wait a minute, wait, wait. That is really preferring not just US as a production place, but US companies. And, and the US has backed off of that. So I think they're wise decisions. I think industrial policy, just let me end with the economist's view. Economists in general don't like industrial policy because they say, well, markets will figure it out. And if markets have, haven't figured it out, uh, why should government do that? But think about these two cases. In the case of semiconductors, this is a national security issue, ultimately. And markets don't pay attention to national security issues. They don't. Governments pay attention to national security issues. Let's go to green net zero. We don't have carbon priced correctly in the world. We, we, we really don't have enough incentives to accelerate action in the market uh, to get to net zero. So what the government is trying to do is say, all right, here are some additional incentives to move faster, to move faster. And I think be, until, and we're not going to get it, we correctly priced carbon in the world, the private sector's decisions about this cannot reflect adequately the externality that the industrial policy is trying to adjust to. Now, Adam, I've read a couple of editorials by you, and I know that you disagree on some of uh, Laura's points. Um, and I believe uh, you may even have a baseball analogy in which to explain <laughs> this, which I will do some interpretation for those who are not American if needed. I, I was so. hoping we could spare our international <laughs> audience that. Um, <laughs> thank you for having me and to be here with this panel and this great group. Um, so I'm not going to go cosmic and say industrial policy is terrible. Industrial policy has been around off and on uh, for a very long time. And sometimes it's coincided with success and sometimes not. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the devils in the details, as was depicted in all four of my, the preceding speakers. What I want to do is raise a couple cautions about things that I think the US thrust and a lot of what Germany, Europe, UK, others have done in response to US thrust, I think overlooks. And there are some ways, ideally, mm -hmm. the industrial policy might be further adapted to make it <clears throat> better. Um, so the first point is, in terms of getting to net zero, I think we need to talk about not just the creation and literal production of new green technologies. We need to think also about their adoption and spread. What matters for productivity growth, but what matters particularly for green growth, is that it's not just, as Germany's already doing, for example, leading the way in its own country. You need the developing world. You need the large masses of population, including China. You need all these places to adopt the policy mm -hmm. and to adopt the new technologies. And I worry that some of the measures being undertaken with industrial policy as it's currently being practiced will encourage natural incentives to have companies be sort of national champions mm -hmm. and then say, well, you know, and then politicians saying, well, we put all this money, whether through tax credits or subsidies or whatever, into these particular companies. So of course we want the American <laughs> or the German or the British or the Chinese company mm -hmm. to triumph in selling their technology to the rest of the world. And that's perfectly understandable, but it's probably counterproductive for getting things priced well for the developing world, for getting at common standards across the world, for getting rapid deployment. And I was very traumatized watching what happened with vaccines, that you know the Chinese party decided they would sacrifice the well-being of their own people so that they would not be buying an American vaccine. And the Americans' vaccines were not properly, in my view, 
disseminated across Africa and South Asia as rapidly or as well as they could have been. Mm -hmm. Again, because Pfizer and Moderna and all these people working wonderful R&D right. had conflicting incentives. So I think one of the things we need to think about as we go forward is in addition to these industrial policies, thinking about the diffusion and adoption and maintaining standards and interoperability so it's not just in the worst case, I'm not saying this is necessarily what's going to happen, but in the worst case, China saying, if you're my friend, you buy my green technology. U.S. saying, if you're my friend, you buy my green technology, and this becomes another political football. Yeah. The second caution I just want to raise, and again, it's not absolutely inherent, but it is a recurrent problem, again, with this sort of national champions dynamic, is, is corruption. And I'm not suggesting that the Biden administration is corrupt. I know many of those people. I do not believe they're corrupt. And I'm not suggesting most private companies are corrupt. But what you do see is when a company is in a favored position and has you know, the manufacturing lives and the political livelihood of a government in a democracy is seen as, do we keep this plant open in this place? They use that as leverage. And that can be very perverting. And I don't mean in a small way. I'm going to name a company that I, you know, Boeing, Boeing still exists. Laura Tyson played an enormous role, frankly, in the creation of Airbus. And um, because she helped us think about the fact there wasn't a competition for Airplanes. large airframe, airframe makers. And she's absolutely right. And the fact that we have two large airframe, maybe soon three, is a good thing for the world. And I agree with that. But we've ended up in a world where Boeing, frankly, is engaged in moral hazard the way a too-big-to-fail bank is. Yeah, yeah. They know no one's going to shut them down. They know that they're too important to the US economy and military and all these things. And so they're not held to account for the recurrent safety failures. Yeah. So again, it's not so much that industrial policy, the free market serves these purposes. I completely agree with many of the comments made here. And we definitely need constructive public investment. I worry about some of the ignoring the international aspects in terms of the competitive dynamics and what that does to the spread of technology. And I worry that we get locked into too much pandering to the company. I'd rather have a little more arm's length, frankly, public sector investing, public sector setting standards, and then backing off. Yeah. So let's take those two up. Like first one, the national champions. I'm going to address that to you, Roland. Do you feel like a national champion of Germany? Is that where you're focused? Uh, you know, are you wearing their vest when you go out on the field and have the discussions here? Well, I mean. I don't know whether the question of being national champion or not, because I do believe more and more um, the, the economies are working and the industries are working more in ecosystems, because, ecosystems. I mean, I talked about digitalization and new technologies. Mm -hmm. There's no company in the world who can, can rock it alone. No. Um, you need a technology stack, so we need, we need partners, and that's what we are doing. We're partnering with, with tech companies, the large ones, the small ones. Um, in order to enrich our own technology to really make it happen, and this is so important. And this is, by the way, one of the one of the changes which we see also in Germany. We come from a from the traditional ecosystem, which is tier three to the list to tier two to tier one to OEMs and they supply. <laughs> it's more about platform-based, multi-sided ecosystems, which are so powerful. So we need that. Um, here comes the point, and, and you have a good point. It's a it's a thin line, and you have two dimensions which are somehow um, controversial. One is, obviously, we want to technologies to scale as fast as possible, as global, as glo in order to save the problems we have. Mm -hmm. um, climate change, uh, feeding 8 billion people, um, and also healthcare systems, which, mm -hmm. are, which are just running out of, of, out of cost. The other side is technological sovereignty, which says, I mean, I want to sit on my technology, and I, 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 I know that this gives me a competitive edge against um, another country who is eventually in competing. So this is a big question we have to solve, and you brought it to the point. For me, it's, I mean, when people talk about um, it's insane that Germany was uh, running in such a dependency on Russian gas. Yeah, it's true. This dependency on the high-performance nodes of semiconductors um, on one, basically one company in one place, mm -hmm. um, this is completely insane. So we have, we have to change that. This brings me to my, my first point about the, the resilience, the over-optimization 
for, for whatever reason, I think it was a monetary reason, it was, it was which was because, because resilience didn't get any credits in the no. capital market uh, um, and so on and so on. So that we have to change, um, obviously, um, and the same holds true for, for climate change because we don't have, unfortunately, a global CO2 price which would solve big, big problems. Right. Uh, because then you have a calibration and say, and, and there is a price for CO2. I mean, just to look at what happens. So this is the situation we're in. Um, and therefore, I do believe it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fine balance to see how we can do. And what governments in terms of policies they, they should do is they provide basically means in order to, to reallocate uh, the way how we are using resources. Also, what you said, digging out resources and sending it to another place so all the jobs are created in different places. What Indonesia does, for example, they say have a regulation in order to add local value. That's all fine if you don't over, overdo it so that uh, you're not replacing one dependency on another one. So that, that's the, the complicated game. Well, the second point that was brought up was corruption. So I'm going to yeah. turn to our two uh, government um, people right now. How are you ensuring that you're building that in when you are building industrial mm -hmm. policy? Um, I'll turn to you first, Minister. Well, um, it's, it's all about uh, transparency. And um, I agree with the comment with regards to uh, national champions, national champions, if they exist, they should exist to be role models of different activities, promote uh, good standards. I mean, if I look at Aramco in Saudi Arabia, for example, it's, uh, it's been a blessing for the country rather than uh, a liability yeah. towards uh, how it just created a complete society, mm -hmm. the Eastern province. Uh, today, it is playing a very important role on adapting different uh, uh, means of, uh, uh, in technology, in the transition, in the environment. So. I think it's, there's a thin line, and I, I, I agree that it's very important to ensure that if national uh, champions are, uh, did exist, they have to be uh, um, treated definitely in the same way like any, any other, other uh, commercial entity. But also, they should be role models. They should be used to, to enable uh, the country, to enable the different uh, industries and uh, otherwise, they become actually a liability. And I would just give an example. For exa when, when we issued, when we started our mining investment law and we started issuing uh, the uh, concessions through, through um, uh, auctions, you know, the first auction, mm -hmm. I was just, you know, uh, trying to, 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 not to bring my emotions because if the national champion got the, uh, was awarded, yeah. it will be thought of as it is a, something that has been designed. Uh, they did not actually. They did not. Actually, they didn't, they didn't win the, 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 the first auction, and we have to be very also uh, transparent with with global players who come to the country. We need to explain what are the role, even. Our investors in da and inside Saudi Arabia, they need to understand what is the role. But if you think about it, as uh, Roland just said, I mean, Germany, uh, if you think about it, the large corporations, the likes of Simmons, uh, 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 do not represent the, uh, the majority. It's this small and medium, the, the Mittelstaat, as you call them in, in Germany, who actually create the, the foundation of the sector, and this is the same thing. But you need the big players to enable this, to make sure that the country is moving in the right direction, uh, the right trends are being actually um, uh, adopted, uh, not to shy away from different technologies, mm. to be role model in every aspect, in human capital, in innovation, in social responsibility, and so on. Okay, I want to turn to you next, Jonathan, um, mostly to hear how you're going to stop there being a national champion um, and also um, how much corruption all the way down the supply chain is going to matter to your industrial policy. But before I do, I just want to let the room know you can ask some questions. If you do have a question, please um, stand up. There'll be some microphones for you. Um, we do have some time for that. So over to you, Jonathan. No, I, mean, look, I think there's a completely fair challenge from Adam. I mean, I'd say, obviously, in the United Kingdom, our historic challenge has not been too many national champions. I mean, we'd, it's been, you know, the problem, for instance, having a, a tremendous development of, of offshore wind, and yet it's not been UK companies, to be That's frank, who, who benefit from that. You know, so it's, it's a, about the... We're looking at it from Good. the opposite, you know, a, a angle on this, but I think the, 
Yeah. The fair challenge, Adam, because you, you design policy tools that are hopefully trying to give you some insulation and protection from that. I mean, your contracts for difference in terms of cost of renewable energy in the UK, a you know, transparent auction process, a relationship between public and private sector, they've been successful in, in, in one regard in that. I think the conversation around carbon border adjustment mechanisms will, will reflect this, a lot of interest around the world. But it's, I mean, as you said, I could think I'm, I'm as a politician, not going to name companies, that's probably right. too uh, difficult for me to do. <laughs> but, you know, I, I could think of bilateral negotiations we'll have or have had in the United Kingdom where, you know, essentially there are only so many partners there and it, it does make that conversation, I think, a little bit more difficult. In the defence sector, I think it is different, but I, I do believe there are, there are mechanisms and policy tools available if you use them in the appropriate way, which are giving you some sort of protection from that as best you can. Okay. I'm just looking around the room. Do we have a question? Yes, there's a hand up there. Um, if you wouldn't mind standing up and saying your name um, before you ask your question... Oh, it's just coming around. Coming, coming. Just that. Uh, yeah. uh, I'm Michael Strain with the American Enterprise Institute in Georgetown. Um, I think this has been a fantastic conversation. One thing that I think has been missing is kind of practical examples of industrial policy. And in my view, uh, in the United States, which is the country I, I know best, nearly all of them have been a complete failure for entirely predictable reasons. Uh, like Adam, I wouldn't want to be an absolutist. You can point to some that haven't been, uh, like Operation Warp Speed, for example, which gave the COVID vaccine. Yeah. But, you know, decades and decades ago, we tried the Jones Act with shipping. That's been a complete uh, and total disaster. President Trump law, uh, launched a uh, protectionist regime to support manufacturing employment. <laughs> that actually ended up reducing Don't. manufacturing Don't. employment. You we have the CHIPS Act right now, which is designed to place semiconductor fabs in swing states in the 2024 presidential election. Those fabs can't find workers. Those so fabs are I, building chips that are out of date. Well, Laura, I see this directed at you because I, there I, was I, I'm trying not to make eye contact. No, with that's okay. Michael and I work on things together. So Laura and I, I have had this fight before. Yes. <laughs> I do not. Uh, first of all, I'm going to give the great example of the biggest success of industrial policy in the United States, and that is the entire biotech industry. Okay, that's it. We have it: pharmaceuticals, medical devices. How do we get that? Massive R and D support massive IP protection, and by the way, massive demand. You can charge anything and Medicare will say, yeah, okay. That's a problem. Okay, so basically that is a perfect example. Uh, we created a whole <laughs> leading industry. Okay, that's number one. one number two. You number might two. find uncompetitive, is that correct, Roland? <laughs> number two on ships, just let me say. The companies, those, where those fabs are built, the companies are involved in making that selection process. I do not think it's for that the, the, ch the choices are made by the companies, not by the electoral swing states. It turns out, ironically, that a lot of Biden money, manufacturing money, and chips money is going to go into those states, and they're not going to vote for him. OK, <laughs> that's true. But that's not why it's going there. And I think it's early to say that the chips measures are going to fail. I think it's very important to say that a massive amount of the CHIPS money is not building fabs. It's supporting research and development. And this is, and to get the US staying at the frontier of technological development in that national security space. So, so I just don't agree on the, on the current evaluation of the semiconductor policy. Uh, let me just add though one thing, a word, which, a couple of words which haven't come up here. The dangers uh, of industrial policy are do you have a, a government with the administrative capacity to carry it out? There's, the US hasn't had that. Now, I think if you look at what the Department of Commerce has done here and NIST, at, which is within the Department of Commerce, and they're setting up this whole nonprofit organization which will actually allocate a lot of the money. They'll allocate the money. So it'll be insulated from political pressure. So and I'm not going to talk about corruption, just political pressure. You want to insulate the decision making about where this money goes, and they've set up structures to do that. So, And then, of course, for the tax incentives on the IRA, 
it's not relevant. I mean, the tax incentives are there. You write them into law, and they, then they're a form of industrial policy, for sure. So I, I saw you jumping in very quickly. Um, I want to make sure that your answer also um, um, maybe tackles this concept of trickle-down, that the people actually feel your industrial policy. Um, mm. Do you want to jump in there, Jonathan? Well, I, just, I think it's an absolutely fair challenge. As a believer in industrial policy, I think some healthy scepticism it helps the debate. And I, you know, like any other aspect of policy, it can be good industrial policy, it can be bad industrial policy. But I would say even politicians on the, what I would describe as the other end of the political spectrum to me in the UK, even people who say they don't believe in industrial policy, most governments have something that I would say fits that definition. I mean, if you think about the, um, go back to the 1980s in the UK, Margaret Thatcher traditionally associated with rolling back the state, you know, very explicit policy to attract Japanese automotive producers to the United Kingdom, which mm. has actually been so successful, it's sustained Brexit, you know, it's still mm -hmm. after Brexit, even though really it was based on access to the single market. Mm -hmm. the financial services sector in the United Kingdom, the big bang, but also we've had effectively, I would argue, an industrial policy around greater competition in personal and business banking. Yeah. It's actually been quite yeah. successful. So you, you can see the trends there, but it can be bad policy. I mean, you know, you have to have, <laughs> you, you have to be able to withstand it. that challenge and do it. Your question about how people feel the benefits of that, well, look, it, you have to obviously recognize that I would say even where I see real successes in the US, that doesn't necessarily, even when you've seen real you know, improvements on growth and productivity that we're quite envious of in the UK, it doesn't necessarily filter through to people. So there's, a, there's an argument about under, making people understand and how you communicate that and how you essentially, I would hope, build a kind of a consensus around the fundamentals that give some security and stability to policy. But you often see, I would say, the, the benefits over the longer term than, than maybe one political cycle. And that, that is a challenge for businesses and for politicians. Yeah. Minister, you wanted to jump in? Yeah. Uh, thanks for the question. I, and I think it's, uh, uh, we need to understand uh, two things. One is policies also have an expiry date, so they don't just last forever. And we need to also be okay. mindful of this and, mm -hmm. and move towards you know, adjustment. And secondly, sometimes it's really an intervention to, to fix something that is already wrong. I will just give you an example. In mm -hmm. Our pharmaceutical sectors in Saudi uh, had difficulty to pick up. And the reason behind this is, is the, the purchasing habit of the government of Saudi Arabia is not industrial friendly. Because mm -hmm. these, the, the tenders, they come out, they come out for three years. So if you lose the tender and you lose 80% of the market for three years, you are bound to fail. So these are the kind of policies that you need also to address in, in uh, bringing back the right competitive uh, landscape to ensure that the sector survives. In our uh, petrochemical um, sector, for example, we had a great policy that made the, the sector grow, contribute to the global uh, demand, uh, reaching almost 8% of market uh, demand globally. But we could not move the sector to go to downstream. It is because the, we were unable to find the right policy to pass the incentive or the energy competitiveness. And now we are changing this. So, Yes, it's a very delicate, and you have to really craft it in a way and follow, understand what is happening. I mean, one of the things also I noticed is that, you know, governments in general have a great intention to help, but they are not the best to design the policy. You need the private sector to be part of it to ensure that once you, you, you have the policy, you are testing it before it goes out there. And even if it does, you need to be able to monitor and adjust as you go. Do we have another? I think we have. Oh, wow, we have a room full of questions. Oh, we better get to these <laughs> ones. Um, oh, who's, who's getting the mics? Oh, over there. Seems the mic Thank you. Uh, Mr. Posen, you did mention the uh, impact on developing countries and the deployment in developing countries. Um, so f one is um, the U.S. is putting subsidies. Most of these developing countries are fiscally constrained. Right. They can't put subsidies or tax breaks. Right. It's just they not going to work. Right. So what is it they're going to do? Right. Second, the EU is putting more of a price on carbon. And so do you think that then the, the, the Ontario world should have the same price of carbon when developing countries did not create the climate change that we have or they have a lower share? How do you account for their lower share of the contribution in your price of carbon? I, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll start, but I, uh, number one, if you think about 
the green industrial policy of the United States, if it succeeds, it's supposed to accelerate speed and scale the development of technologies which are uh, helpful to get to net zero. If the US succeeds that way, then essentially you're driving down cost curves, you're driving down price, you're driving down the green premium. Those are products and services which could benefit not just the US, but the US as a supplier, as an exporter of these things that will actually be more efficient and cheaper and better because the industrial, because the industrial policy has been a success. So I, I actually think of the industrial policy to create a stronger green sector, and I'm just using green to cover everything in the United States, actually can have global benefits. It's not distorting. It's actually promoting. It's scaling. It's speeding. As I said, it's going against the green premium. We know that uh, public policy was very important behind what's happened to the price of solar and wind. It didn't happen by market accident. And that driving down that cost curve is important not just for the United States, but for the world. And by the way, China was very important here too because they were helping yes. drive, driving down that cost curve. So it's a global, it's a global industry and I think there are benefits. Adam, do you it. agree with that? Uh, only in part. Um, <laughs> there you go. Uh, I, look, I, I think there's no question you have technology and going down the cost curve is helpful. But I think we have to be realistic. I mean, if that was really the case, we should all be overjoyed that the Chinese provided all their subsidies to their solar panels. I'm sort of we happy. should we should not I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about the world. We should not care that the German solar panel industry disappeared yeah. or that there's no solar panel industry in the US. We should just be buying as many solar panels That's as fast as possible throughout the world. That's not how the politics has played out. Now, if we could get a set of rules and do those sorts of things, then I'm totally on board with this. Mm -hmm. The other thing is going with Johnson's point, okay. which is also very important in the Bidenomics, is the idea of getting the, the working people buy-in, however you define that. But there's also the getting the developing country buy-in, which is, I believe, what the questioner was, was referring to. I had, and again, it, there's fine lines. I mean, we've had Brazil and India blow up constructive trade agreements in the past. So it's not that they're sainted and always right. It's just that when we talk about getting buy-in and the UNCTAD, was it the UNCTAD? Yeah, I think it was the UNCTAD director general mentioned this the other day. And I had the Indian finance minister speak at the Peterson Institute last April and she spoke about this. Yeah. That, that, you know, India sits there and says, well, we want to have an industry. Yes. Why shouldn't we have an industry? So then they decide they're going to do subsidies and put up protections against people who can undercut them and cost. And they're going to say, well, if the Europeans put on a CBAM, which for a variety of reasons is a good thing, they're going to say, but that's just to get us to subsidize your green advancement and keep out our so-called dirty things. So we're going to keep out yours until we have green. <laughs> and, and, and no, but I mean, you can go and watch the video of the Indian finance minister Do talking that way. So, so all I'm trying to say is, we have to address these aspects. We can't just have the US sit there and say, we're gonna drive down costs and it will trickle down throughout the world. I don't think that's right. But that isn't, but that isn't what, so the goal of the industrial policy itself is not trickling down to the world. You, you, what, you, the goal of the industrial policy itself is to create expedient and, and scale technology for In the zero. US. Okay, with, with the, but it, if, you want, if you want to add to that, you've got to come up with a set of international policies, yes. okay? That's all, it's to say that the industrial policy itself, it does have global goals in the sense that it's meant to affect this transition to green, okay? It does have that global goal. It turns out that a lot of the way the incentives work, it would be to produce that in the United States, that's right. So then the question becomes, all right, what else should the US do? Whether it's, for example, uh, in working with um, our, we, the US has very little national, we don't, have a, we don't have a belt and road. We don't have a fund to go around the world and spread our technology very, we don't. So what, do we, what, do, what should we do? I guess I'm saying what should be the complement it's not that the industrial policy itself is wrong, it just doesn't go far enough 
to achieve what you want to achieve in a developing world. Well, that is going to require other things. At That's the risk of having the Americans take over the international okay. discussion, okay. I am going to leave it with <laughs> sure. three non-Americans to, I guess, answer um, Laura's question in a way. So yeah, how do you do it? How do you do it? How do we make sure that this isn't an American-led um, industrial policy that we are seeing, uh, you know, I guess it's not trickle down, as Laura says, but that it is a fairer and also collaborative um, uh, kind of uh, working environment. So I'm going to okay. not allow the Americans to speak, and I'm going to go to left first with you, <laughs> Minister. What, what would you say is the is the is the answer to that question? Well, it's it's very hard to see the. Uh, we need the consensus on how to do it, and without the US, it will be very hard to to imagine such a consensus happening. And then, uh, but definitely, it's very important that also, once we do this, we are doing it in a way that is uh, helping other countries address their own uh, pace. And also, uh, and I think uh, what we are missing here is how other countries, other people are doing it. Because it's, I mean, if we look at S Saudi Arabia, the way we are transitioning, it's. Mm -hmm. it's 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 quite uh, you know interesting but nobody seems to be interested to see what we are doing because no, we are delivering it's actually it's so important. rather than just being uh, trying to uh, to put the regulation uh, and uh, i'm not saying it's not important i'm in fact on the contrary but i say it has to be complemented with the local uh, probably uh, expertise and the local uh, knowledge and what can uh, others also bring to the table. Okay. What about from your point of view? How do you counter the great American force here? Or do you need to? <laughs> I don't know whether, whether this is the answer. And by the way, I'm not sure whether this healthcare or life science sector <coughs> is a good example of subsidies because I'm not aware of any country who has a higher share of GDP in healthcare spendings than the United States. I was talking about biotech. I wasn't okay. talking about oh, the biotech. whole, just biotech. Because, because that touch the nerve. Stuff. This is so. <laughs> but wait, my, 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 my take is the following. I think yeah. a, a minimal, minimal invasive um, um, interference of the government is, is the right thing to do. So, um, and it should focus on providing the basics. What are the basics? It's, uh, it's a compliant, uh, st secure, and stable system, which is very important, so that you, if you invest, you know your money pays back and, and has a, has a secure. Secondly, is providing a proper amount of uh, resources, meaning people. I mean, this is about education and training because this is very yep. centers, including a proper infrastructure, sure. digital infrastructure, sure. logistics infrastructure that really want to have. And then, and then put a frame around, um, which is uh, putting, giving the right direction. Is it a CO2 price? Is it a resilience? Because, I mean, you're, you're the example on photovoltaics in China, that nothing's bad about uh, getting cheap photovoltaic modules. The only point is, if this ends up in another dependency on just one supply out of one country, That's it's another story. That's so if you have that frame and then let the market go, that's maybe a good idea. Jonathan, last word from you, and that's it. We have to I wrap up. Yeah, it is a superb question. It's one of the outstanding policy challenges, but it is genuinely an area where, as you said, you've got to go beyond industrial policy. I think it's much more about you know, the, the financing of that transition in those countries, the cost of borrowing, how debt is treated, how multilateral institutions yeah. are, are reformed to facilitate that. What is maybe the intriguing bit of industrial policy is are, are there revenues that will be available in future revenue streams from things like how you know, a level playing field on carbon might be considered that would free up resources to do that. But it is, it is an area where you have to go a little bit beyond industrial policy to, to really get a proper answer to that. Well, hopefully we'll be on a panel about that next year. Yeah. So <laughs> thank you very thank much you. for joining me today. Thank Thanks very much. Thank